Welcome back to another episode of the SaaS Buyers Club. I'm your host, Omid. And I'm your co-host, Joe. And this week, we are going to be speaking with Juan Gonzalez. Juan, thanks for joining us this week. Thanks for having me, guys. Really yeah. happy to be here. Good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. This is great. I enjoy, I enjoy talking with you guys. Thanks for having me. And he's got his cup of liquid power for the people that are listening to the podcast. He's got a, a mug that says liquid power on it. Is it full of coffee? It, you know it is. And this is only yeah. cup number three of the day. So I'm a little bit behind schedule. So, oh, man. <laughs> I, you're sitting worried. I thought it was like Red Bull or something. I was like, that's not. Not that hasn't happened before. Innovation runs on caffeine. So there we go. And you've got some yourself. Oh, I do. Actually, though. But as you get older, you stop drinking energy drinks. So I don't drink energy drinks anymore. Yeah, I'm super health conscious, dude. But in sitting at a desk all day doing this kind of work, can just be draining on your dra draining on your body and draining on mm -hmm. your getting to the matter at hand. We usually like to start off with a little bit of introduction from you. So, who you are, where where you're from, what you're doing right now, and how that, especially in the context of how that's applicable for uh. SAS in minute audience. Yeah. So I, again, my name is Juan Gonzalez. I am a 20 plus year veteran of software as a service and managed services. I have played the role of head of customer success, chief customer officer, VP, SVP of customer experience for managed services providers and SaaS companies like Bullhorn, Upserve, Ipswich, and most recently Carousel Industries. I was brought in to all of those companies to help them move towards a scale event, a scale and transaction event. And for the past couple of years, I've been consulting. I've been running my own, my own consulting firm called Technosry, and we help other organizations manage through this question of scale. How do they better engage their customers, their communities of clients at scale? And definitely in the past couple of years, the conversation has been how do we create a new model in this post-pandemic reality? Because what we thought was going to drive scale pre-pandemic and certainly amidst the midst of that 2020, 2021 pandemic, rules are very different. So I have found myself doing a lot of great work with a lot of organizations of very different sizes and industries, not your typical SaaS players, really thinking a lot about that retained revenue and that sort of SASE model. And it's, a, it's been a wild ride, as I'm sure you guys have noticed from your work and your guests. 100%. Okay, that's a really good background. Why don't you, can you give us like a concrete example? I don't mean to hog the mic, sorry. Just kind good of thing. question in the chamber. Can you give us one example of something more concretely that you've done this year and how it illustrates your expertise? Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, my my work with customer success and client experience is really business operations at its core. How do you help predict and forecast where an organization is going to reach its revenue target. So at the start of the year, I worked with a national laboratory uh, and diagnostics company, better understand their leaky bucket problem. Why were their clinical sites in their hospitals not sending them the volumes of tests and samples that they thought they were going to be getting? And we quickly uncovered over a 90-day period how the sales team, the customer experience team, even the lab, um, weren't really tracking a lot of those performance indicators around knowing whether or not the customer was fully onboarded, knew how to submit their materials, knew how to get the business intelligence and the value from the platform that this lab had built to drive this scale. And so we, we really re-engineered and re-architected those leading indicators and focused instead on where is the leak really happening? That was an example at the start of the year, and we were able to fix that just through some very simple metric-driven business planning and performance management. Awesome. I tend to find most organizations have a similar problem. Usually it's in the onboarding where we know most of the churn tends to happen, whether or not the mm -hmm. customer renews. It's that critical first 30, 60, 90 days after closed one, go live, whatever you want to call it. And so I have found healthcare, retail, financial services, and now increasingly security and defense are the major industries that are grappling with this sort of unpredictable and unmodelable churn. And that's mm -hmm. where I come in. Interesting. That's super helpful. Thanks for that. Omid, why don't yeah. I throw them? 
What's a, I'm going to take us in a, like an interesting direction. What's a hill you're willing to die on? What's something you wish that you knew all of your clients? What, what's something that you wish all of your clients knew, for example? Mm, that's a cool question. I like that a lot. Retention is not a quick win. Retention is a long tail and long-term battle. Uh, mm -hmm. Many clients come into the retention game or even the SaaS game and say, if I just pour gas right now on this problem over the next 30, 60, 90 days, well, in the next six months, I'm going to have some measurable outcomes I can report to my board, to my investors. I'm really use this as a fundable milestone. Uh, but that's not true. As I think we all know, and certainly as my experience has taught me, customer success and retention in SaaS is a 12 to 18 month journey that involves re-architecting your process, rethinking your go-to-market, and then getting all the teams aligned on telling that story, delivering that value. Uh, but that's not, a, that's not a sexy soundbite. Executives really like the vanity metrics like NPS and they miscontextualize what NPS really means as an example. So the hill I'm willing to die on is this isn't quick. And it isn't really a band-aid. It is a process to re-engineer how your teams, your people, even your customers think about your company. That's just very different. It sounds like that, just to vibe with that for a moment, it sounds like that myth or that expectation that, oh, there's a problem, we can just fix it really quick, is also grounded in the root of the problem itself. Mm -hmm. That is the root of the problem itself is correlated with having a misunderstanding of, for example, what the customer thinks about the product, their customer's desires, or what is making them customers unhappy. So they, it sounds like almost just retention itself has in a lot of these cases where, and in my own experience, a lot of these cases where it's not doing so hot, it's a more fundamental mismatch with the yeah, I would agree entirely, Joe. I think from my perspective, one of the biggest challenges we see is that retention is a whole customer journey go-to-market exercise from acquiring the customer, and that includes the marketing and the sales exercise, to onboarding the customer, adopting them, driving value, and even the upsell, cross-sell that goes into that renewal motion. All of those pieces are deeply connected into that retention story. And if you're not delivering value, if the customer doesn't know the value that they're supposed to be getting, that the salesperson told them they'd get, that they themselves realize they're getting when they're onboarded and they themselves acknowledge internally is valuable, timely, and relevant to them, then you've lost them. But that's not to quote uh, politicians, but it does take a village to really keep the customer engaged, but it also needs to be really proactive where I often find the failure in the customer journey is when people focus on a single moment, like the renewal. We got to just focus on the renewal, even three months out from the renewal. If we do that right, we'll keep the customer. It doesn't work that way, right? If the customer Funny, was just... missold, misadopted, poorly onboarded, there's so I'm, many critical quick, points of failure. Quick to put in, it's if you had an anniversary coming up and you're like, <laughs> yeah, I have three months to like, Lock this down. Yeah. Better get her on, like a uh, buy-in. <laughs> yeah, it's just how a relationship works. It really isn't. I've been I've been a terrible partner all year round. But hey, I'm going to suddenly remember what yeah, she wants exactly. two, two months before the anniversary, and I'll uh, I'll avoid divorce. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, no, please <laughs> continue. So Sorry, I cut you off there. No, can't... you nailed it. It's the journey, right? What you were saying though. 100%. It is the journey. And I think that this idea that it's just customer success's problem to keep the customer or account management's problem to keep the customer buying more things or the renewals team's problem to just keep them signing that renewal, that's a failure in my view. It suggests that the only people who own the customer are those with the term customer or account in their title. But we know Everyone is in business to deliver value to the customer, even those team members that you would historically think don't provide value, like the finance and the billing teams. They're clearly customer facing. They're, in fact, arguably more impactful to the customer from a tactical operations side, right? They're sending the bill out and the customer sees it front and center. I have found that if every team thinks of themselves as owning the customer co equally, then it just changes the way the company thinks, operates, and achieves. 
So many breakdowns come down to the fact that people are treating the customer like a hot potato, whereas everyone should be really embracing the idea that, no, we're in business for these people and the work that they do. That's been my perspective. Okay. It's like... What do yes. you guys I actually have a follow-up question. What I heard you say is what you wish all your clients knew before coming to you was that it's not these kind of vanity metrics like MPS score. It's not like a short 30, 60, 90 day process. You're actually not only looking at maybe like a 12 month cycle, for example, for like really putting in robust retention systems. We're looking at a 12 right. month cycle. We're looking at actually uh, incorporating different teams a across the company, for example. It's mm -hmm. not only just the customer success team or the people that handle tickets or whatever it is. Yeah. It actually is even teams that you wouldn't think off the top of your head that they would be involved in customer success. For example, the finance team, people that send the bills out. So what does that look like? Would you help us understand a little more in terms of that 12-month process? So what, what are we doing with those different teams? What, what is it that you do with these different teams? How do you um, implement your customer success models? Yeah, and, and I think that's a great question because how you operationalize customer success is really how you tell the story of what the company does, the value that it delivers, why a customer should care. I find the exercise of getting everyone in a room and talking about who's doing what in those four broad swaths of acquisition, adoption, onboarding, value delivery, and renewal, upsell, cross-sell, those four stages, it really unearths a lot of the silos that a, a, every company has. And in fact, the older the company is, the more deeper entrenched these silos are. But you would be amazed at the number of startups that actually feel really siloed when it's just even four or five team members. You've got everyone sort of living in their own slice of the business. And that absence of conversation and transparent joint accountability on what we're doing to help the customer be successful, that conversation is the critical moment. It's not even drawing some beautiful infographic or creating some document. That's almost just like an afterthought. That's an evergreen document you're going to revisit every now and then. But it's this exercise of getting people in the room for 30, 60, sometimes even 90 days to review what the, the steps look like and who's doing what. And so when you bring in those teams and you ask who's responsible, right? Think about a racy matrix. Who's really responsible for this moment? We start to unearth that everyone says, oh, I got a stake in doing this work for the customer or doing this particular task we really start to understand that no, most people are just consulted or informed. Only one team generally is responsible for doing this thing. So as an example, delivering a, a demonstration of a software to a prospective customer, it's generally the sales team's responsibility, but marketing, product, technology, even your account management and customer success and support people, they all have accountability for making sure that sales has the right information, is set up for success, has the proper training. So just having that conversation on that one moment becomes really transformation. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what do those conversations often sound like between those teams? When you pull everyone in and you start to ask the question, what does this look like here? you just start getting a lot of great feedback from all the team members assembled. So if I bring in the entire sales team and we have a session on, walk me through what it takes to sell to a customer. It's amazing how everyone has a slightly different version of that story. And we're just not talking about pitches or the, the value story. We're talking about who's doing what. And that conversation, just allowing others to hear it, starts to unearth the silo. So I like bringing my sales and marketing team together up front right away. And you start to quickly hear the disconnect that sales has from marketing. So marketing will say, I generate these leads and I hand them over to sales and they've been pre-vetted. And sales says, most of those leads are worthless anyway, right? They, they aren't really sales qualified. They might be marketing qualified, but, but they're not sales qualified. And then you get this sort of challenge around, what do you mean they're not sales qualified? They're marketing qualified. Didn't we agree to this three years ago, what this might look like? 
So you'll start seeing that breakdown in communication and you start to unearth something really valuable. All right, I see I see here. So it's like it's bringing alignment across the teams that everyone has the same understanding because the telephone game is hard where a message gets transferred even where it's a company's value proposition and it should be very clear what that is for example everyone still has different interpretations of it. Yeah, I would say that half of the battle with customer success and customer onboarding and the general journey tends to be a question of the uh, whether or not everyone knows what everyone else is doing. So it's half the battle is purely operational. The other half is really that engaging the customer. But before you can even get to engaging the customer, you have to ask yourselves, what's everyone doing? Who's on first is almost a, a reality of a hilarious skit unfolding before your company. You just don't know until you hear people say things. And then that's what really becomes the valuable exercise. You do this once at the beginning, and have this catharsis of unearthing the problem. But then you got to revisit it every quarter and say, hey, are we still doing it this way? Tell me what the last quarter's been like. And then you'll start to see these other disconnects emerge. What often happens in customer experience and in just go-to-market generally is there are these breakdowns in the engagement story. And that tends to just not be visited. So then when you fix it the first time, you think we don't have to revisit this for a year. But people, they don't work that way. You get your biggest pain points up front, but over a while you're reminded of these tensions that you've had with other team members, with other parts of the company. Uh, and if you're not having a regular cadence of communicating and engaging in partnership, you won't know where those pain points are and you won't build that new muscle memory that helps everyone think about how they work centrally with the customer. Mm, love it. Yeah, we went deep there. To bring us back to a little bit broad scope, just just curious, any kind of information on the size of companies that you work with? When do typically companies need to find you? So on and yeah. so forth. So I, I think any company can benefit from business operations review. Uh, I tend to find that Series A, first institutional investor, around 10 million, they start to get a little bit more serious about that question of the value for the customer. But True customer journey orchestration and this idea of mature go-to-market doesn't really come into play for most SaaS companies until they're around the Series B, C stage. So anywhere between 25 to 50 million in annual recurring revenue. Most of the companies that I have worked with tend to come to me around that Series B, C moment. They've got a healthy yeah. chunk of revenue. They've figured out who their customer is, but they haven't exactly figured out how they scale that customer substantially. Mm -hmm. But I will say, especially in this past year, so many companies in the series A, pre-seed or pre-A seed stage companies, around 10 million, they start to come and they say, all right, money has dried up. We, are, we need to show growth. How do we do it at this stage? And while you can't and you shouldn't really invest in, in client experience or customer success, at that stage, because really the that 10 million, you're really still focused on like the white space, the go-to-market selling, acquiring logos. It does help you to start building some of the performance metrics in place. And where I think most companies fall short is they're only focused on the GR or the NRR or the annual billings. And they don't really see the long tail of everything you got to do to predictably get there. So if you build some of that early on, the performance management culture where everyone says, okay, I know that if I generate this number of calls or this number of meetings, I'm going to have a conversion rate that leads me to these early signals that will tell me that I'm going to hit my number for the year. If you build that muscle, then you have a totally different experience growing the organization than one that's pretty reactive and waiting for the deals to come their way from marketing and sales. And, and it's just a very different sort of cadence. I will say seed stage, so less than 10 million, very foundational. I wouldn't expect them to get this sort of value of the business. Yeah, they're still like, condition. who's our customer? <laughs> so yeah, there's no optimization to happen yet because there's nothing like foundational that's in place that they've yes. figured out. They're still in that figure it out journey. A hundred percent. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I think that is the story of the tech downturn in a way is that the saturated market and the sheer number of players at the small end who built these adjacencies, these one-stop shop, like little tool that's special and good enough at the right price point. 
it was easy to get those customers when money was plentiful and no one was asking tough questions like, what do you mean I need another calendar app? Don't I have one with Teams? Why am I getting a, another one? No one was asking those questions, right? But now on the other side of this, it's why aren't we using a single consolidated solution? That's what the enterprise customer asks about. And then the, the small guys who thought they had an ICP, they, they really don't. They, they don't have a unique and differentiated value. So I think that is a key problem that all like less than 10 million in ARR companies are now struggling with. And I think it's why you've seen a quarter of a million layoffs in tech this year alone as we move to that rapid consolidation. Yeah, yeah. The Google CEO, he was in the news, I think yesterday, and his comment was, we could have handled the layoffs better. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> hilarious comment. I don't like subtly saying like we really screwed up is really what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, me and I have a history of making fun of uh, that and typically lay off some relation positions. Yeah. So, I mean, you're on a roll with some, oh, were you going to say something there, Juan? No, not at all. I'm agreeing. Yeah. I mean, you're on a roll with some good questions there. In the back of my head, I've been thinking, okay, I definitely want to ask some questions around acquisitions. What are you thinking about right now? Amit? Yeah, that was actually the direction I was going to go. We've been, we've inter interviewed some serial buyers, some serial mm -hmm. acquirers on the show. And it seems that in the current economic market, the banner that they're all waving around right now is bootstrap, ash efficient, growth retention is really important, mm -hmm. uh, especially for those, yeah, five to $10 million ARR companies, which it seems like is like really the sweet spot for serial acquirers that are looking to go in there, buy them up and build them up and scale them and hold them. Yes. Um, so that's really interesting. I feel like there is a, a clear alignment there with your value prop in terms of, yeah, once you figure out who your ideal customer is, it's time to optimize and, and get efficient in how you keep them happy, how you yeah get as much LTV out of them as possible. So very cool. And just curious, I would love to hear a little bit about your experience with acquisitions. Yeah, so I, I personally have been either in the C-suite or in the functional VP level for six acquisitions so far. And my function has largely been to help prove the sustainable value that drives that multiple. So on the like series CD stage, you're generally looking at a three to five X multiple. That's what the going rate has been historically, and it's survived this sort of pandemic madness. But in the smaller side of the less than like the five to 10 million ARR, you're looking at valuations that have moved south of that 5X number, a little bit closer to that two to three X number, because it's a question, right? It's, is this as unique and differentiated as the, the company says it is? So that's problem one. Are you able to show growth? And if you look at the major private equity players, Vista Equity, Insight Partners, they really have great playbooks. And they're not really trade secrets. In fact, Insight goes out and publishes these beautiful, vast presentations around follow these metrics and you'll know. But the big shift that I think we've all seen in the past three years or so has been a move towards EBITDA as, as you say, that cash conscious, that bootstrapped mentality. And I don't think that transactions are happening in organizations that have a negative EBITDA right now. Or if, the, if it is, it's really a like an IP grab, not a company grab. So that is something really important to think about. If a company is moving towards transaction, they're a negative EBITDA, they're burning cash, and they have an interested buyer, they need to understand they're, it's not for the people or the processes, it's for the product that they're moving towards that acquisition. So especially in the sub 10 million market. But everyone in the 10 to even 100 million space, they're having a sort of a real return to the fundamentals of business especially in EBITDA, especially in that growth rate of your customer acquisition. And so things like fundamental GRR, are you at least 90 to 95% in your gross retained revenue? And in that net retained side, are you able to upsell, cross sell closer to 110, 115%? If the answer is no to either one of those, it drives down your valuation. And especially in a much more crowded market where it's, the value isn't particularly clear, you have a hard time selling. You really have to start asking the question, where am I going to find a buyer?
for this thing. And that's, I've had a lot of conversations around that one too. The market is consolidating rapidly at the lower end. In the middle end, it's having a hard time really finding people who want to move in if the numbers don't line up. That's so interesting. I'm hearing back from you a bit of your experience there related to acquisitions, but also yeah, just some industry stuff too. But also it's really interesting to hear and talk about just current, just really the current state of the market. Yeah. And what a lot of people industry wide are having to deal with <clears throat> in regard, let's talk a little bit, let's dig down a little bit on any of those smaller deals and consolidation. Mm. It's just an interesting subject to talk about. Do you feel like you have anything to add in there, Juan, about that? About the acquisitions themselves? The uh, about state? About, yeah, exactly. State of the market, smaller acquisitions, consolidation. Yeah, I think a couple things have really struck me as um, very indicative of the current state of the market. So in 2021, about half of all SaaS companies sub 10 million were moving through rapid consolidation. And if they were part of a PE firm, they just literally got contaminated with another close enough portfolio. So you look at Insight Partners' mass layoff activity and integration of their portfolio, and you would see companies reboot their leadership teams. And that was really driven by the lack of unique and differentiated value, the fact that they were always EBITDA negative, that there was no really clear path to growth for them. Um, and in many cases, this was an expensive write-off for these guys. And, and Insight was very public about it. Vista went through a very different rationalization exercise across their portfolio. They actually moved to sell off a number of their wholly owned or, mar or majority owned entities to lock in their multiple. Um, so you'd start seeing the difference between the, the New York PE and the Texas PE approach. When you start looking at California PE on the sub 10 million, you really start seeing a very different story, not a single way of dealing with the problem, almost really leaning on the fact that they are fairly cash rich, trying to see, can we wait it out? So the battery ventures, the Sapphire partners of the world, they tend to want to wait a little bit more, see, can we wait out this post-pandemic period, start seeing growth. But in either of these, in both of these cases, all three of these cases, you see any organization sub 10 million really struggling, so trying to survive. And I think this was a foreseeable problem as many companies in 2018 started to move away from the one-stop shop bundled solution. Oh, we will all be like Salesforce and we'll have a one-stop shop. That was hard to compete with back then. Because, you know, if you're going to be like Salesforce, why not just buy Salesforce? So they instead started to break out their feature modules and sell them as standalones. That was great in 2019 and especially great in 2020. But as we started moving into this middle to late pandemic period, these standalone death by a thousand cuts that the enterprise customers were seeing, they're asking the question, right? Do I need something else? Do I need yet another Calendly? Do I need yet another unified communication and collaboration suite, especially when I'm already paying for Google Apps or Teams or whatever your office productivity solution is. So the veering away from the one-stop from the one-stop shop to the side adjacency offering by SaaS actually laid the foundations for their own failure and disintermediation from the market as mass consolidation on the customer side started to happen. So mm -hmm. it only stands to reason that mass consolidation happens on the vendor side too, right? If customers are like, no, we're going to stop buying from 20 vendors and we really just want to stick with three, do you really need 30 different calendar SaaS apps out there? <laughs> Probably not. And, we're, and we can go in so many directions on this one, but anyone know, who looks at AI right now and doesn't see the same bubble forming around AI the way we did with NFTs and the way that we did previously with these adjacencies, is just still too much in love with the promise and not seeing the fundamentals of the business lead us to this like cliff moment. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot in that, right? <laughs> yeah, no, there is. There's so many ways Lots to unpack could go. And I've been resisting the whole time to bring out the A word because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it always leads, it always goes that way, one way or another lately. Uh, that's a great name for another podcast, the A word. The that's A word. The Critical on artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> my only comment is buy more Nvidia stock. <laughs> Isn't that true? There's nothing. But that not financial so advice. Not financial <laughs> advice. That really is financial advice. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, my God. 
Um, so seriously. Anyways, but so much going on there. I'll, I'll put a few more comments on that topic. Actually, add some yeah. to all the giggles, but it's sure we're seeing a lot of other, a lot of one-off solutions out there too that are also just struggling to find their own product market and figure out who their users are. But in reality, a lot of these companies are, I'll say a lot, it's a vast generalization, but a lot of these di different segments really have companies doing the exact same thing. And they're all just, I'll, I'll use the word flopping around, but it's, there's, there's, let me put it this way. There's only so many ways you can skin a cat, right? And they're all using a lot of the same background knowledge on the engineering side. Even a lot of cross hires is just how you're, you're supposed to build your own app is just hire the other guy's engineers. So we're definitely preparing ourselves for an onslaught in the next five, eight years. He's kind of all realizing that they make the same thing, which I actually really love. And I think about this quite a bit because from a consumer perspective, that just means there's going to be more com competition for value and price for the consumer. It's really going to help innovation just eat, kill itself, grow back stronger type American growth uh, that we're going to be seeing in the next several years. So I do look at it from a perspective, even though being those companies today is, is definitely like a, a race. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a marathon that you're supposed to be spread. Yeah. And how unfun is it in many ways when you, the company comes to that realization that they aren't unique and they aren't differentiated? Like this idea that the thing that I was building that I bought into myself, I'm not seeing the market see it the same way that I'm seeing it. And the ones that survive are the ones that listen generously to the market and know what the customer is telling them. The ones that don't survive are the founder led organizations who lead with hubris and say, Nah, I've got the answer. When in reality, no one's got the answer. You should only come with the question right now. And I think that's what really makes a great company in SaaS is the one that says, I'm who I am today, but who could I be tomorrow? And really being open to the countless possibilities. Two examples from the Vista portfolio that are sure. from my past, right? Bullhorn, before it was the number one applicant tracking system in the world, right? For staffing, People, staffers, recruiters, they use Bullhorn, right? They were a local job board for creative types in the greater Boston area, oh, right? And so their earliest investors, which included Vista in the Series C round, they said, this is cool and all, but your tech is really the interesting story here. So have you ever thought about selling your tech as a platform solution rather than selling your job board, right? And that led them to a phenomenal journey from 50 million to 200 plus million, right? And now dominating the market. Another example, Upserve, which is now Lightspeed. They, they were, before they became the re restaurant analytics platform that now hospitality and restaurants use to figure out what should they be selling to their customers to run a more profitable business. They were really, they were known as Swipely. They were a square competitor and their value wasn't the credit card swipe. It was very much the underlying universe of data that they were building up from their customers, which just happened to be mostly restaurants and hospitality customers. So you don't know who you're meant to be until you start listening to what the market's telling you. It's, yep, that app you created is cool and all, but have you ever thought of doing it this way? Because we really have this other problem and we think you might be able to help us with that. Founders generally are hostile to that idea because they come mm. with a vision, right? Company visions don't survive the myopia of, I don't want to pay attention to what everyone else says because I know what the customer needs and I'm going to make sure they take what I'm feeding them, right? Mm -hmm. That is usually who's going to go out of business. And if they don't go out of business within the first five or six years. Then eventually when the reality hits them, they go out of business very quickly and it stuns them. It's, oh my God. How did, could this have happened to us? If you were selling the same thing over the past six years and never really reinvented yourself, put yourself out of business, then someone else put you out of business. And usually the customer does it for you. <laughs> oh, I, I line, actually. Somebody's going to yeah. put you out of business and usually it's the customer. It is. And it's buy versus build, right? The customer will often say, man, am I going to find a vendor who's already got this bill? Or am I going to have to use my tech team to build this tool for me? No customer wants to build this. 
themselves. Mm. They may say they want to build it. No customer wants to do that. It takes on, they take on so much tech debt, so much responsibility, and people actually get fired for building these expensive They're going to mess it up. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> So I'd rather such, put that on. Yeah, the it's such a journey. It's such a difficult journey. Why wouldn't you just, if you could just buy it, why wouldn't you just make 100%, more sense? hundred yeah. percent. hundred percent. So we're on the topic of your time with Vista. Yeah. Juan, we'd love to hear more about your experience there. So what did that actually look like as you were head of customer success, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's been a great journey because I had finished leading as a, as a partner and managing director of a marketing and communications firm that worked with nonprofits, government entities, and really large companies to help them figure out social media. So in 2010, so many of these companies had no idea what to do. And I had built a, a great business there. Vista approached me and said, Hey, you've got this great client services thing going with these customers who don't know their own value and how to communicate that value. We have a theory, Vista said, we have a theory as to how that gets done on software at scale. So when I joined Bullhorn, I was a, a customer success director. I helped lead the enterprise function. I worked with a great team and supported that enterprise team to build something relatively new for the Vista world, relatively old at that time in 2015 for the sales forces and the larger SaaS players. So Vista had a very clear theory and they call this their go-to-market business best practices. They even have a twice a year summit where they pull in all their portfolio companies and all their newly hired customer success executives and they just show them the way. What I found really impactful is they always came armed with the same set of questions and they never provided the answer. But what they actually then said was 80% of all technology companies are the same. And the 20% that makes them different does not matter in the go-to-market, which a founder would hear and would say, that's crazy. You can't possibly yeah. say that. And Vista would say, thank you for your service. We're not going to put a new CEO in place, right? And the proof is in the transaction, right? Because they grow these businesses around customer centricity. So around the Series C moment, they bring in people like me. They start to convert the sales teams into these account management teams. And you see this in other Vista portfolio companies like Acquia, the, the Drupal enterprise developer, content management for organization. And they start to really move towards this, let's discover who we are meant to be. And that exercise is honestly, it's why I do this. It's a thrill ride like none other. We can all come and say, we have a theory as to what this company can be, but one, only when you start hearing what the customer says, here are the problems we're trying to solve. And you hear that, you hear it at every stage of the customer journey at sales, when the salesperson's showing the demo, delivering the pitch, building those opportunities and proposals. Customer will say, this is great, but here's some other problems in our pipeline we're trying to solve. You hear that on onboarding. This is great, but can we also put this in our roadmap for future? And you also hear that in QBRs. And so many companies do a poor job of listening at those three stages that they miss the, honestly, the, the money machine at that moment, which is what the customer is telling you they need. Vista does such a great job teaching people how to listen. And that is what I brought with me when I went from the Bullhorn experience and Vista sold to Insight Partners to then leading customer success at Upserve. And I helped transform the account management team over a period of a year to a really great customer success organization and helped launch a support organization out of Denver. So really doing that concierge high touch at all stages reactively with those tickets, questions, I need help to proactively, like, are you getting value out of this thing that you bought from us story? And it led to pretty clear, almost immediate changes in the way the customer thought. So Vista's theory is if you listen generously to the customer stops thinking of you as their vendor, they start thinking of you as their partner. And when that happens, mm. The mm -hmm. moment of transformation happens because the customer stops imagining being able to do this without you. And they start realizing, I can't possibly run my restaurant without Lightspeed, or I can't possibly sell things if I don't have a CRM like Salesforce, right? How am I going to do it? I can't do this with an Excel spreadsheet. Are you kidding me? And that's a valuable shift in perspective that Vista really operationalizes. And they have a very tight, three to five year journey. It's three to five years, three to five X, move on. And as they often like to say, 
where we control, we Vista control the portfolio company, we always make money on that deal, mm. which is funny because they're also then saying, if we don't control it and we can't force this perspective, well, we may not make money on it, but, but it does work. It works. Oh, definitely. That's really cool little insight there. I don't have any comments. I have this like winter growth tag. I know my kids do too. It's just, it's not going away. So it's interesting. I see a big parallel here with product-led growth. Yeah. Um, if you're familiar with the, the PLG principles, mm -hmm. it's quite similar in terms of, it's not just about giving free stuff away anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it actually is, are we listening to the customer from the pr perspective of the product such that we had Wes Bush on here, for example, who's mm -hmm. you know, a book on PLG and so on and yeah. so forth. He's a previous guest of ours, and his whole thing is it has to shift at the cultural level. Actually, very similar to what you're saying in terms of everyone has to be thinking about the product from the perspective of how does the product apply for the customer. Yes. So yeah, I, I it, it and it's interesting in, in that perspective. I feel your application of PLG is like very directly customer related around the account teams, the marketing teams, the sales teams, and even some maybe outside facing teams like the finance team, for example. Yeah, yeah. I'm super curious, if we were to do like a thought exercise right now, let's say Joe and I are founders of a SaaS company that's generating mm -hmm. five to 10 million in ARR and we mm -hmm. come to you, let's say we're generating like 10, 10 million in ARR at, sure. at the ceiling and we're like, hey, Juan, we wanna optimize our business, optimize for retention rates, and optimize for customer success because we want to sell in the next one to three years, for example. Mm -hmm. what, what is Juan going to do? So I think scale, and I, I go back to the foundations that the PEs all talk about. Insights mm -hmm. got their scale model. They, in fact, go so far as to call every startup a scale up. And Vista obviously has their trust the process approach. But it comes down to the foundations. And I would ask both of you, why are you in business? And that is not an easy question to answer because in asking the theory of change, what you're really saying is, why is your company in existence? It, it needs to be aspirational and also timely and relevant. Your core values and the company culture, they're anchored upon your people and how they see themselves as a part of your vision. So if you and Joe, if Omid and Joe cannot say, we are here to do X because of Y, then how could you ever expect your team members to suddenly get in line with the reason that you're, you're in business? To them, they might just think, oh, great, we're making great software. Or back in the old Google days, we're kicking ass and taking names, right? It was easy when money came very easily. But the why, the theory of change, the vision statement is really the foundation. And so many companies, five to 10 million, don't really know why they exist. They know what they do. They may even think why they do it. But they don't know why the company itself existed in the first place. From there, everything else foundationally emerges, including things like the plan that they need and a process um, that they build around the plan. So company- Can you give us- Yeah, go ahead. But before we move on to the next step of the question, I'd love some examples of what are proper reasons for why a company exists, for example, that you've heard. Yeah. Like I how mean, should a company is... be thinking about why they exist? Well, so the, lot, though. it could be, I know, I, but want, like, I want to hear your examples, but I'm just thinking, man, there's probably <laughs> so many, but let's just get yeah. maybe one to two. So you, the right solution is actually proven out by history. So in the 1950s, there were two companies that were very, very similar in the staff, in what they produced, in even their way of thinking about pursuing the market. And they both came out with vision statements at the time. One company said, we are going to create the best cartoons that anyone has ever seen. People are going to see our cartoons and they're going to say, these are the best cartoons I've ever watched on television. Mm -hmm. Another company said, was identical in every way. They said, we are going to create happiness. And Hanna-Barbera, the former, went on to go out of business 30 years later. And the latter became Disney, the world's largest conglomerate for media and entertainment on the planet. And so some of this is about aspirational open-endedness, but some of it also cannot be, be too untouchable and unreachable. Apple's early vision statement was just, we think different. What does that mean? How do people connect themselves? 
to that vision. It took Steve Jobs being fired, coming back, taking control of his company and re-architecting a new vision centered around human-centric usability where people forget that they're using technology that changed the course of not only Apple to make it the most valuable company on the planet, but also all of the technology companies that had been out-competing Apple before that because they were basically providers of tech and now they have to be providers of user experience. So being able to articulate your vision in an aspirational but also accessible way for your people leads to that transformational scale moment. And if you're not aspirational enough or you're not relatable enough, if you fall short of either of those, then you go the way of the Hanna-Barberas of the world, right? It's a great run. You're going to go out of business pretty quickly when someone else figures out the next story, the next step. And for Disney, it was not just making great cartoons. It was building theme parks, creating experiences, going into movies. Like every corner of the entertainment universe was their playground. They never shut themselves off to that possibility. I think many companies need to go through a basic exercise and it's hard, but it doesn't take long if you really ask the question, why? Why do we exist in this universe? And if you can answer, we exist in this universe to do X so that Y can happen, right? We exist to make the world a safer place to share data, or we exist to make sure that every customer uh, enjoys their food at a restaurant, right? Make an aspirational yet concrete, relatable story, then suddenly people will say, oh my God, this isn't just a job. I'm on a mission. And that's where the fun part comes. The vision comes first, then the mission. How do we do this? How do we create dreams? How do we make the world a safer place to share data? And it's that mission that starts to create the customer journey, the go-to-market, who you hire, what you build, what you do, and you never fall short. If, you're, if you don't change your vision frequently, the mission is constantly iterating to make sure that you achieve your vision. And it's easier said than done for sure, but the people who run into problems never did the vision state, never did. The I love this. I love this. <laughs> Joe, why do we exist? I why do we oh, exist, Joe? I, oh, I, can give a, I can give an answer to that, but I love this too. I'm just actually being really quiet here because I love the content. And so why do we exist? Not our hypothetical company, but our law firm. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. law firm. yeah. Why does yeah. the law firm exist? One, and then the first statements you made was like, we navigate people through the, there's, gosh, okay, I have to put it one That was sentence. what came I to mind for me like too. That direction that you were going in was like what came to my mind too. It's the Sherpa analogy. Like yeah. expert mountaineers are great mountaineers and they could climb and scale the mountain without Sherpas, but they still absolutely need Sherpas as their partners and they love having them because of the so expertise like, that we, they offer. Yeah, so we're like expert advisors on acquisitions and that's just like the what we do, but the aspirational and the more what was the other part? You said aspirational and what, what was the other thing you said? And, and attainable, right? Attainable. Oh, okay. So okay. it can't be no. it can't be so far out of reach that someone can't see. Yeah. Okay. Part of so it. The aspirational and attainable sort of aspect of it though, or maybe I'm just gonna comment on aspirational here. Yeah. Was just we 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 were trying to re envision MA advisory because let's be clear, all the top law firms out there. Are most of the top law firms out there are babies. They're literally like the age of, of one generation. Well, we count a generation yeah. is 30 to 40 years. That's not what I'm referring to. But my <laughs> dad is almost as old as a lot of the top law firms in America, for example. And so law firms themselves have this constant change in reaction just to the dynamics of the then present market. And right. we see that change occur again now. A lot of the big players simply are not going to be able to respond, react quickly because they're just, we could say they have tech debt themselves. They're just, they're bloated with their prior systems and processes that they are not going to implement the new AI related software products and stuff like a smaller firm can, or at least we're, we're also tech sort of backgroundy people. And so like the aspiration there is, man, we can re-envision the M&A advisor space Mm -hmm. Using AI and changing the customer process, and changing the fee structure, uh, basically just offering a way fucking better product to customers using innovation and just our industry and the old school industry knowledge. So that's some more info there. But 
like I said, it was going to be more than one sentence. It'd take me like a several minutes to put all that into one sentence. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, so you have the foundation of some, what you do and how you do it. It's also the, you want to backtrack in the, why does your law firm exist for the benefit of others, right? Like mm -hmm. when, so another example, this laboratory I was working with earlier in the year, they'd never done this vision exercise before, even though they are a national laboratory that everyone knows, right? And when we worked together and they started finding the pillars of, wow, we exist for the health of humanity. Like we help sick people get better. That, and another good example on this vertical, think of really great hospitals like Boston Children's, one of the top children's hospitals in the world. Their vision statement is a destination story. And you get chills every time you hear it. Their vision statement is, until every child is well. Mm. It's a vision they will oh, never be able so to beautiful. achieve. It's a beautiful vision. And that means we're in this to help sick children get better. That's it. And we will do whatever it takes. So their mission changes frequently because what imperils children will change from age to age and time to time. But their North Star is always until every child is well. I love that. That's such a... Yeah. It's wonderful. Really and I think every tech company has a similar journey to go through. If they skip that step, it, it, they get into trouble later on. And it may not be evident until they've broken 20 or 30 million in ARR because then they think, oh, we're selling. It's a great time. Who cares? We'll just continue doing what we're always doing until the customer puts you out of business because mm -hmm. they start to think, oh, these guys are just building a widget. I'll build my own widget or I'll find someone else who builds a better widget. But it's hard to put Disney out of business because who, like, no one got fired for engaging Microsoft. No one got fired for engaging Disney on a creative project. People get fired all the time for building it themselves, for finding some outfit that doesn't have a proven vision. So I think that's the real risk. If you don't have vision, how can you scale your people, build a plan, build a process to get you to the next stage? And I think that's a critical risk for many SaaS companies. And you're seeing most of them go out of business right now. So yeah, that's so interesting. It's like a meta analysis too. We're talking a lot about tracking a lot of these really more basic quantitative things that are so relevant and necessary just for essential operations and analysis during the buy and sale mm -hmm. process. But on the other hand, there's this, there's an overarching more kind of, so I got that throat thing again, overarching deeper qualitative perspective where it's the business might be doing well, but there's these really deep underlying factors that if you're missing those or they're not keyed in, doesn't matter how, how quickly you've grown over the last five years, you might just be heading the wrong direction too. Exactly. And I think if you want to sell in the next one to three years, having a clear vision statement is the quickest way to getting your people on board and getting a prospective mm -hmm. buyer to say, wow, these people know who they are. They know where they're going. I need to buy them. And so I have seen the vision exercise as the biggest accelerator to a sale. So if a company's got great financials, has great metrics, and they're not finding a, bu a buyer, let's lock their marketing sales founders in a room and come up with a, like, why do we exist? And then you will find a buyer who says, I like that. I don't do that, but I want to be doing something like that. Let's bring you in the fold. Omid and Joe, if you want a buyer, let's do a vision statement that finds someone. Uh, we don't want a buyer, but let's do a vision <laughs> statement anyway. <laughs> so we're going back to your earlier question. How do I sell in one to three years? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, we went back to Joe and I as SaaS founders. As SaS SaaS founders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe not your law firm, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where we're at, Omid, well, with, we're in deep right now. We tell, yeah, tell it. Bring, uh, Good stuff. Let's, let's so take good. the hypothetical <laughs> further, man. Yeah. Yeah, totally. We might have a SaaS company by the end of this call. <laughs> that, the absence of decent vision statements should be a huge business opportunity for founders. But founders go in with a solution, a what am I doing and how am I doing it? Not why should I be going into business in the first place? And this is really what makes founders so imperiled in the M&A process so dangerous in the early stage startup seed stage process why 95 percent of all startups never make it to their series a because founders believe they have the answer 
because they've never laid down a vision exercise. Because if you have a good vision, you know that your what I do and how I do it will be changing all the time. And just naturally, you're going to go back to this listening exercise. Okay, fine. I want to achieve this. But how do I achieve this? What do mm -hmm. I do? How do I do it? The so vision simple. answers the question. Yeah. Go, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Bill. What were we going to say? I was going to say, it seems so simple, but on the other hand, it's not. It's like a, a real big self-analysis and market review. And you have to know, understand the technology and where it's going and what people want. It's really a big question, even though it seems so simple. It is. The output ends up being simple. This really elegant 50 words or less. Sometimes ideally less is more, right? But the getting everyone to feel like I'm on board this thing, it's hard because especially if you didn't do it at the start, you have a lot of people who joined this thing for different reasons. And you got most of your people probably joined a visionless organization to make money, to have a job, to pay their bills, right? All legitimate reasons to have a job by the way, right? right. You've got to pay the bills. But if you want to change the world, if you want to build the next Disney, you better have a vision of how you're going to do it and why you exist. And that is time well spent. I love that. That's so good. I can see in the buy and sell process too. So back to, I guess I'll take it back to the hypothetical. Yeah. As we discuss our business vision with you, we're really getting you bought in with our vision and you That's can right. see where we're going and what we're trying to do as opposed to just saying, okay, they have this tech talent and they have this revenue. You can start yes. to see a future that involves that business being under your ownership and succeeding and continuing to grow. And maybe the, maybe we're still involved in a advisory capacity or something because we're all now we're stuck in on the same vision. And same future roller coaster that we want to continue forward with that team and leading mentality. And so now we're all suddenly on the same page with what we want to do with this business. And you're excited. We're excited about the future. We can see it clearly. And you'll have questions too. You'll be like, you want to do this or that about the, let's just say the MA software market. Yeah. But what about all the other competitors? And we'll be like, they're not doing this as part of their, there's, there's a lot of things we would discuss there about a Q and a essentially as to whether or not the vision makes sense, whether or not it's a fit for that category or target demo. But then ultimately we would just be like locked in all, almost from that conversation and, and still other parts of the process too. But that's, that's very much like one of those, not trying to say like, selling the vision but it is really selling the vision i don't like that phrase but it is no selling. it is you're absolutely right and a good vision makes it easier to sell the product as well as to sell the company right because if your vision is grounded in how you are going to change the world or change the market or change change your theory of how you you matter why you matter and how you're going to change then you truly have no competitors if your vision is clear and you are true to yourself, well, people don't do what we do. Are you kidding? Mm. No, Hanna-Barbera, they're just a uh, cartoon so company, awesome. right? Yeah. Or, oh my God, you want to, I guess if you want a Dell, Dell sells Dells. Do you want a lifestyle product, right? You want to change the way you live? Come to Apple, right? And so being able to sell at a premium is almost impossible without a vision because why would someone pay 30% more for the frankly, identical, if not inferior hardware capacity that Apple sells, if not for the vision of how they deliver it. Literally, I can build my own machine, which I do for gaming, right? I build my own machine. I have fun with it. I'm paying 60 to 70% of the cost of a similar machine from Apple. But mm -hmm. oh my God, the Apple experience is better in every way because that was their vision. We're going to make people forget they're dealing with technology. We're just, it's going to be a joy to use. So in the theory of selling this vision, being able to blur the lines between work and play, between value and purchase, between happiness and the challenges associated with doing what you do, that is very much at the psychological interplay of the buyer and making them believe that I'm not just buying a product or a service or a company, mm -hmm. I'm buying an experience. And that has no price that is too high to pay. So I do think this vision exercise is critical. And I think it is the foundational moment from which 
everything else stems if you really want to scale. And so going back to my own experience, Bullhorn, when it le- heard the product, and this was before I joined the organization, so credit to Art Papas, the founders, the Vista team, when they heard of this need and they decided that their vision ultimately was to make it easier for everyone to hire people who are looking for a job, right? Then suddenly everything changes in the organization and you're no longer building a, like a job board. You're building the solution to make it easier for people to find a job and to hire people, right? And I think that is just a powerful reminder of who's going to survive this consolidation exercise in this post-pandemic period and who you can reliably say is not. Like Mm -hmm. companies that lack vision, who are burning money, who probably still have the original founders at the helm, they're in trouble right now. And I, again, not financial advice, right? But for me, this is a, I would be very concerned about those companies. And I would say, what can we do to get the founder out and get in a good operator to help rethink the why and then get a plan around the why together? Because you can do that pretty quickly. You can do that in three months or so and get a new customer journey, hire the right people, find your gaps. You cannot really do that if the founder is still seated in that organization saying, I've got the answers. I don't want to ask the questions. Mm. That makes yeah, a lot of sense. There's also a message there for founders too, in terms of, hey, don't be a know-it-all. Yeah. Simply. yeah I, oh, I like that. I like that. So to twist this a little bit from the pers- for the perspective of a seller founder, who is now talking to buyers who might have a different vision or have a different intention for carrying the business moving forward. I guess the best way to look at it would be and the way to really take and understand what we're talking about is that the buyer might have other requirements, uh, different plans for operations, a different vision moving forward for the business, but ultimately that contains the success of the business. And depending on the circumstances, the business is doing really well, the retention of the employees and their growth. So there is a line with the seller, but sometimes the seller founder, but sometimes that founder and his understanding of business is delimited to such an extent that there are him, the the new operations are going to be different is essentially what I'm saying. And coming into a sale transaction with that expectation and not being like, oh, they, you're, they're going to have to do it the way I think. Or, oh, like I'm definitely still going to be around. This business is going to do what I want it to do is definitely not a good mindset to be in. And, and that will definitely scare away buyers. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. Truly visionary organizations survive M&A events. And in many ways, the vision of the organization provokes and challenges the vision of other organizations around them. So you're able to see when an acquiring organization sees a visionary company and they're inspired and challenged by them. That's part of the excitement. So again, from my past, Progress Mm -hmm. Software, a publicly traded software and application developer, acquired Ipswich, a 28-year-old software company that basically brought about consumer FTP. and I served as the first vice president of customer success for Ipswich, and my job was to help communicate the value of the story because the company had a great value story. It had 80 million in annual billings, 300 team members, around 35% EBITDA, which, oh my God, this is like as efficient as you could possibly get, right? But they had failed in repeated due diligence efforts because the story wasn't clear to prospective buyers. It was like, Isn't this like money that the customer is spending beyond the initial purchase, just insurance? Isn't it just like access to support? Like, why would the customer keep spending it? And how much is the customer really spending? Mm. So when you back away and challenge the organization to go through this vision exercise, Ipswich came up with the, and the team, credit to the team for this, because this was marketing-led, sales-supported exercise across the C-suite. They came up with the phrase, we make the world a safer place for data, to share data, right? Suddenly you have everything. You've got their data story, the FTP story, their network management story. All of their adjacencies no longer seemed like one-off cash grabs. Conversely, all of their customers no longer seemed like people who are investing in an insurance policy if things were to break 
on their end. You start to see the pieces of recurring revenue of, oh, these customers want the peace of mind of a safer world to share data, right? Because if Switch offers it. So for progress, they were just seeing the, and per their public press release during the acquisition, which by the way, was a 2.8X acquisition at 225 million for an $80 million, 28 a year company. They said, this is immediately accretive to our balance line or for our balance book for our customers. And it is inspirational for our journey as a publicly traded company. So they were delighted by the whole story and vision was a key part of it, a key part of saying, here's why we exist and here's how we show the value that we do in order for what we exist. So it's not just SaaS companies, every technology company, managed services, on-prem, they all benefit from it. No, I love that. I love that so much. So go on. Over. Question for you, Juan. Founder comes to you and you do this vision exercise and they've been, they've been and, but what I hear, what I'm hearing almost I've heard you explicitly say it, and I also hear it between the lines is founder vision is founder vision, right? So they got to, for example, 10 million in ARR. That's right. There, there wasn't, maybe there was a vision. Maybe the vision was not, what did you call it? Aspirational enough, mm -hmm. for example. So how do you help those founders step into that aspirational mm -hmm. vision? Because they clearly don't necessarily have it. Yeah. What does that look like? Is this is a I humility it... exercise for sure, okay. right? Omid, I think this is a challenging problem. Founders got to where they are because they believe in themselves, their confidence, their arguably their arrogance and self-centered view of the universe leads them to say, I can do this better than anyone else. <laughs> okay. And I'm creating this thing. I once worked with a founder who said, and I'm sure that you're, you guys are going to hear this all the time laughably disprovable statements like oh. I'm the war I'm like the state biggest job creator. Why aren't people like, well, that's not true. Fidelity and Hasbro and blah, blah, blah. Very quickly, the argument falls apart, but they don't hear that. And Steve Jobs was just like that too. If you re ever read the, uh, the Isaacson biography, I, they I called this the reality distortion field oh, that yeah. surrounded Steve Jobs. He would say things that were provably untrue. Uh, and I so don't, I don't know this at all. I didn't build out. No, I'm sure not. So how do you deal with this go-to-market psychosis, right? As I like to think of it. You got to basically remind the founder, you got a choice, right? You can either continue believing you have the answer, in which case, wow, you're spending a lot of money for people who you're going to micromanage out of existence, right? So what a waste of their time and your money, right? Or maybe you can acknowledge that you don't have all the answers. And that's why you're spending this much money on these other people who may be able to ask the questions. So shifting from the, I have all the answers to instead, I need help asking the right questions is really the key moment. And I don't like working for a founder who isn't in keenly interested and curious about questions they don't know the answers to. And neither are most of the PEs. So if you see a PE make an investment in a SaaS company, and they don't replace the founder within the first couple of years, then it's because the founder has already agreed to take a back step and allow the operators to take control. But generally by year two, year three, founder gets clipped or gets put into some sort of peripheral role. And, and then the operators take over because otherwise the venture is doomed to fail and PEs will not let it fail. They just want their money back, right? Yeah. So I think that's the, to answer your question, Omid, does the founder know they don't have all the answers? And if they are willing to accept that they, in fact, have very few of the answers and that they had only enough answers to get them to this point, maybe, then you've got something here, right? Ipswich, Roger Green, after the helm for 25 years at the company, said, you know what? I've taken it as far as I can go. I really want to retire. And so he found a great operator to be his CEO, his actual his former head of sales, who, who's better at listening to the customer than salespeople, right? So the former head of sales becomes the new CEO of the company and Roger Green retires. And then pretty quickly, you get this journey to discover who you're meant to be. Conversely, companies that tend to keep the original founders struggle in this question because the founder will want to stay at the helm. And another thing I look for is founders at smaller side, like five to 10 million, if they say things like, I just need transparency and I just need accountability from my team members. 
you got to read between the lines. What they're really saying is, I don't trust these people. I need to micromanage them because only I know how to do this the right way. So they're not transparent enough. They're not doing their job right. I'm going to tell them how they need to do it. What else am I paying them for? You got to flip it. It's, what are you paying them for if you're going to tell them what to do and how to do it? So I think this is just a critical moment. And no founder likes to hear that they got to go. It's their baby, right? They created it. They're software company, but I got to tell you guys, like there's only one Mark Zuckerberg out there and people aren't going to get an 18 to 20 X valuation for their company. And yet everyone got drunk in the late 2010s, believing they could all get 18, 20 X valuations. But one of the best valuations in the past five years was upserve sale for 8X to, to light speed in 2020. That just, that doesn't happen anymore, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. back to earth at three to five X. And that was without their founder, by the way. So I, I think you got to recognize that prices come back to reality. Things are worth exactly what someone's willing to pay for them. And if a founder continues to insist that they've got the answers, that they know the price, that they know the value, the market will correct them. Yeah, I love that. That goes, uh, that goes in alignment with one thing I love to say to founders who are in a position where they're too attached to the business and don't just look at it as an investment asset. Mm. And at the end of the day, you might have built it to have all of those ties and memories associated with it. But a lot of people get surprised when they're with their business for 20 years and you can't hold on to it forever. You have to really, you have to let it go at some point. And that point is definitely, it should definitely be sooner than later. You should diversify, you should sell, you should get out of your own way. You should, business is good. You should probably be early retirement, spend time with your family or doing other things. Like yeah. a lot of people do get too stuck. And that's a problem because then you can miss the best time at which, and we've been using, throwing this word around like the exit sweet spot, but really it just refers to exactly what we're talking about right now is just the appropriate time to sell and People will, maybe the guy will be like, in our example, maybe I'm like, no, Juan, my vision is the way it's going to go. You get out of here. <laughs> and I might end up on the oh, literally <laughs> and not just metaphorically. Yeah. But at the end of the day, market timing is only meets every so often in the sense of you might have had it, had it right for a couple of years running, but there's nothing keeping you from fucking up and ruining your own business. and. 100% when things are going well is not a bad thing. No. And this is why 95% of all startups never make it to series A, right? The founders are still involved is one of the key factors. And not just that the founder is still involved, it's that the founder doesn't open the door to the possibility that maybe there are different questions they should be asking. And if you're coming out with this cool app and the founder's all about the app and is, oh, I built it myself in college and it's the best app ever. And it's going to change the world. And I'm like, what's a calendar app? What do you like? So what do you mean it's going to change? The, world? I, I, the founder will be like, fuck you. It's going to change the world. And then you see the psychosis, the startup psychosis here. So you've got to come. But that's so interesting because that's such an aspirational founder though, right? So oh, he, he meets. But is it attainable? Aspirational. Oh, that's <laughs> the is, it attainable? It, is it attainable, right? Like I'm going to change the world with a calendar app. Does not compute. Yeah. You got to get the two levers in place, yeah, right? Sounds like, like, yeah, they're equally important. He's like, remember, Steve Jobs was never the transformational leader he was until he got fired, went into the wilderness, and rediscovered what he needed to do. He started three different companies before he came back to Apple, right? Yeah, he hung out with the Beatles or something, right? That's what. Yeah, well, he lived in India for a while before. He's just this man went through self discovery, and when he returned to Apple, there was this strange both combination of arrogance and humility at the same time. I know who we have to be, and I'm going to ask the questions that will help us figure that out. It's the two things, not knowing the answers, but having a firm belief in your vision that drives that moment. And you look at every great company, they have outlived their founder. No great company still has their founder in control. And many people will say, oh my God, what about Meta? You've got to be kidding me right now if you're telling me that Meta is a great company. They are very much <laughs> a very large startup, right? They are a very large startup. But until Mark Zuckerberg is able to step away from it and new operators are able to come in to help them become who they're meant to become, you will never know 
the full potential of Facebook and Meta and all of their properties. You will just you ever see that happening. Thinking. It's inevitable. He will die. Inevitably, he will die. He will die. So it after will Mark Zuckerberg all dies, people. Facebook will reach its full potential. Microsoft didn't reach its true potential until Bill Gates stepped away. And you had these other operators, including his personal assistant, Steve Ballmer, who like started out his job as Bill Gates' assistant. Actually, uh, so, this, I'm from Washington. No, Ballmer was his, act, his PA, though. He I was, was, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've seen all of the commercials that, that Steve Ballmer used to make. Like hilarious, like Wait, window... Back. You should look up the Windows 1.0 commercial. I've, he, I've he probably seen him. I'm sure you have, but this is like you the don't... Vi ridiculous videos of Steve dancing and stuff. Oh yeah, he is. He's having the time of his life, and the man did not know what he was doing, and he admitted it straight up. So he surrounded himself by brilliant people. And one of my favorite Balmer moments is when he's being interviewed after the iPhone gets announced, and he's like, "No one's going to use the iPhone because where's the keyboard?" And then he ends it and saying, well, what do I know? I'm just the CEO here. He's right. Thanks. He was right. What did he know? But no great company is able to survive if it does not outlive its founder. Otherwise, it's just a founder-led enterprise, right? Which is not bad. But like, how do you create something that lasts the test of time that is truly a legacy? You've got to prove that it is more than just the person who founded it. And that requires Brilliant. inherently letting loose, letting go. And most founders don't want to do that because I don't, I genuinely agree with you, Joe, that most founders are creators who have created this thing. It's their passion project. They are not business people because if they were business people, maybe the first thing they would have done was say, you know what? This isn't a hobby. I want this to be real. Let me find a real CEO and hire them to run this thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. And there's beauty in that too. We're not deriding it. There's beauty in being a creator and figuring things out and wanting to do your own thing and having your passions. But when it comes to business at the end of the day, are you trying to make money? And that might not mean just sitting with your artwork all year. And there's other stuff involved. Yeah. It's also a challenge to true believers because true believers are raised. And I'm, I was raised the same way. Parents tell their kids, believe in your dreams and do what you love and the money right. will follow. Life isn't that simple, right? If you want money to follow and great things to follow, trust the process. As Vista says, like there is a method to the madness. If you want great retained revenue and growth of your customer base, Maybe you shouldn't micromanage your people. Maybe you should look at the, the work that they're doing and the leading indicators every month, right? Every company that grows does it the same way. That isn't to say everyone's doing the same thing, but it does mean that the thing that everyone's doing kind of resembles the same model. And why reinvent the wheel and suggest that you don't have to worry about the wheel, that somehow this thing is going to, you know, question mark profit its way into success. And I think that is a challenge because true believers believe in themselves first and then in the promise of the unknown second. Customer experience and customer success teaches us that you don't know any of the answers and your true belief has to be in the unknowable future. You can't exist for the customers you have today because they will only take you so far. You must exist for the unknowable customers of tomorrow. And in that possibility, you go through this beautiful journey of discovery that maybe you are in the calendar app. Maybe what you really are is all this like logistical meeting mashup stuff that suddenly you are a time management platform instead of this calendar app that you thought you were. You'll never know if you don't ask the questions. So getting founders out of the way and going through this vision exercise lays the foundation for process and the types of things that investors look for, right? Are they do, how do they know they're going to get to this number at the end of the year? That's an easy answer if you're an operator. It's like, here are my leading indicators. Here's, how, here's my like OKR methodology for my team. Everyone's got a number and every number plugs into one. That should be a five-minute question, gets you past due diligence. You get straight to like the offer very quickly at that point. But if you're stuck in the, how do you know what you say you're going to do? You don't have a sale here because you don't have a process. And you're probably just banking on the dream and not, banking on a methodology. No, I love that. I think that's also a great pity statement for sellers out there 
to get really into the mind of a buyer and see, you know, what the process looks like a little bit more than we've discussed previously. Mm -hmm. And just having your story and your numbers together really yeah. explain it. You very often see sellers and buyers just talk too much about the transaction and not just, I mean, it, it, again, back to the trust in the process. I mean, mm -hmm. there are a lot of just little basic things like that are super key, but a lot of a seller could go on for four hours about how you need X, Y, Z to make the business succeed in the future when it's okay. That might not really even be relevant to your team. Yeah. And why are you selling? Because if you could do X, Y, Z to get the business to succeed in the future, wouldn't you do it? to get command not, a higher price, always, right? That's yeah. all we've been response to. <laughs> I do want to call out that we're hitting around time. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel like this has been such a cool conversation. We're I've enjoyed the, yeah, we're just organically like chit chatting through the content. Omid loves to do this thing where he does, we do tip of the day, which is, it's hard because we've already been talking about a lot of really cool learnings. I'm not going to steal Mead's thunder. Why don't I give it over to you, dude, to ask that? Tell him what it is. Yeah, Juan. So <clears throat> it's like a 30 second, one minute sound bite, something that we can turn into a, yeah, like a pithy clip. And uh, yeah, it's like a message that you want founders to hear in terms of the number one thing that they should be thinking about in terms of the way that you work with them for example? Yeah, that's a great question. And I will say organizations and founders specifically should be asking of their teams what they can do to help. To lead an organization is not to provide the answer, but to ask the question. So instead of telling people what to do and how to do it, ask them how you as their leader can be accountable to them to bring them the resources they need to succeed. Because at the end of the day, your team has to deliver on the value that you expect your company to deliver. And they cannot do it if you are not providing them with the everyday agency and resources to achieve their number. So your check-ins with them, your conversations with your team, even your conversations with your customer, they should never be, here's what you should do and how you should do it. It should always be, hey, this is the problem you're trying to solve that we agree jointly you should be solving. What do you need from me to ensure you can solve it? That change in servant leadership is transformational in the same way that a vision changes a company for the better. So I would challenge all founders, all team leaders, all managers, all client-facing people to think about generous listening on what they need to provide for others to succeed because therein is the magic secret sauce to scale. I love that. That's such a good tip of the day. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Juan. And to start to bring us home, it's another episode of the SaaS Buyers Club. And I'm your host, Omid. Yeah, your host, Joe. And thank you so much, Juan, for uh, joining us here today. How would people, if people were to engage you for your consultancy services, where would people reach you at? Yeah, definitely reach me at my personal email address, juan at juan.co. That's the best way to, to get me. It's I'll, happy to hear you and see where I can help. Awesome. Yeah, you gave yeah, me. We'll, and we'll definitely put all of that contact information in the show notes as well. So people will be able to reach you like that. And if you're listening, please subscribe, follow comment, reach out to the guest. If you have any questions, reach out to us. If you have any questions, we love to hear from our audience and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me.